proceeding. I'm Beverly Hartline. I'm the Vice Chancellor for Research and the Dean of the Graduate School at Montana Tech. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the first Cafe Scientifique at Montana Tech this academic year. Um, the Cafe Scientifiques are sponsored both by the Montana Embry Project, funded by the National Institutes of Health, and by Montana Tech. And we are really delighted today to be able to host uh, Dr. Sandy Ross. He's from the University of Montana. He's a professor in the chemistry department. Maybe it's chemistry and biochemistry. Chemistry and biochemistry. Chemistry and biochemistry department. And, and Sandy is a physical biochemist um, who is really an expert in time-resolved excited state spectroscopy and single molecule interactions. He also um, runs the, is the director of the biospectroscopy core research laboratory, which has a lot of really great instrumentation that are available to host other people using, not just at the University of Montana. Um, when I got to Montana Tech, he was the dean of the grad school at the University of Montana, in addition to being a professor of chemistry. And he came to Montana in 2001 after uh, 20 some years at, 20. as a yeah. professor at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York City. Um, so I, it's my pleasure to welcome Sandy Ross to talk about investigating biomolecular interactions and dynamics through time result micros microscopy. So Sandy, welcome to you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much everybody and good evening. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And it was interesting because when Bev turned up, she actually knew me from my graduate school days at the University of Washington, but I didn't remember. But that's, I think, because when you become a dean, everything kind of goes out, the, out your head. But a couple of years ago, I was uh, returned to the full ranks of faculty, which was a lot of fun, uh, getting back to teaching. And I've been director of the biospectroscopy core which is part of the uh, Center for Biomolecular Structure and Dynamics and serves um, the user community, scientific community, the University of Montana, and also within the Montana University System and the greater world without those who would like to use it. What I'm going to do today uh, is a couple of things in the talk. I'm going to give you a little bit of background on what we do in the biospectroscopy core and some of my own personal research. I give you a little bit of history of uh, some of the ideas that go into the methodologies that we use, which is time-resolved fluorescent spectroscopy. And <clears throat> then I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some recent instrumentation acquisitions that we've made, which we use primarily for biophysics and also cell biologists which are trying to do some fairly fancy experiments, which I'll talk about. But also these are uh, excellent instruments. One of them is in particular, particularly useful for material science. And so I'd like to I'll focus on those. You're welcome when I get to any part of the talk to stop me anytime, ask me questions. Um, I'm not trying to get to any place except to try to introduce the materials to you within a reasonable amount of time, not taking too long. And with that, let me just go ahead and get started. So the first what, um, image here is just basically shows you a little bit about what our lab looks like. It's not going to look like this for long, but this is where we do a lot of our spectroscopy. There's microscopes in various places on a big optical bench, some ultra-fast lasers. There's computers along the wall that you can't see. But this looks like basically any physics spectroscopy lab. That's basically what we have there. And we do, we work with, in my own research, the uh, structures in biochemistry called nanodisks. I'll refer, return to these again. They're related to the good HDL, the heavy HDL, these little proteins. That's what you make when you uh, have um, kind of clear cholesterol out of your bloodstream. But they're good platforms for uh, looking at proteins and protein interactions. I'll talk a little bit about some of the instruments that we've built in the lab. Um, the work which was done largely by uh, Michelle Terwilliger, who has her degree in electrical engineering and from Bozeman, and for her master's thesis, um, built a confocal microscope, infrared microscope for the Mars lander, which is quite a master's thesis. 
amazing. She's just an amazing instrument builder. Um, unfortunately, she's left. She's taken a job in administration. But we've just, as I'll mention at the end, I now have a, um, a new staff scientist in the lab who's also a great instrument builder and does a lot of works with microscopes and is interested in single molecule detection. And this just shows you some of the kinds of fluorescence experiments that we do with single molecules, trying to look at distances between domains where we can change conditions where you have one distance and then when the molecule unfolds and undergoes dynamics, you would see two distances. And this just shows you some tethered nanodisks on a surface. We do other experiments look called you know, looking at blinking. So the questions that I'm particularly interested in are structure, function, and dynamics of biomolecules. And we're interested in the functions, the biological functions, which are mediated by these motions, these opening and closing motions, for example, uh, motions of motors that, on DNA, for example. Uh, interested in catalysis, allosteric regulation, assembly, and the kinds of events which are mediated by macromolecular interactions. So for example, uh, duplication of DNA, recombination, repair of it. We need to do that every day, constantly. Sometimes we end up with cancers because repairs don't work, um, and a host of other processes. The sort of questions that we're interested in in uh, our funded research is, what are the important end states? So how can you tell when you get from one part of a reaction to another part of a reaction? What are the important intermediate states? What happens on the way there? Uh, what starts the interactions? What regulates and controls? All biological reactions are highly controlled and regulated in the body. And then there have to be feedbacks. How do you terminate them? For example, we've done a lot of work in blood coagulation. And one of the issues in blood coagulation is that you start the coagulation cascade. And once it starts, how do you stop it? Because if you don't stop it, you'll turn into a solid clot, and then life's over. But we have great control mechanisms so that scabs stay located. And it's because the proteins which are involved are membrane proteins. And so the reactions stay localized. It's absolutely fascinating. So the example of the sorts of problems that we've been working on recently is regulation of G proteins, which are proteins which carry signals, smell, sight, touch. Um, there's a lot of drugs that are involved in regulation of G proteins. And one of the questions is how you keep go from active states to an inactive state. And so there's a nucleotide called guanine triphosphate, which when it binds to the G protein, it's, it's in an active state, and then when that hydrolyzes, it's a high energy bond, it goes to an inactive state, and then there's a regeneration pathway. And these are called activating proteins that do this regulation. And example of what happens, for example, going between the active state and the inactive state can be seen here. This is um, a protein which is involved in asymmetric cell division. So when, after fertilization, and uh, cell division, there has to be, there's a symmetry produced in, in the cells, and there's a uh, protein called RIC8A, which is involved binding to the G protein, and it helps to carry out that function. So it's a really a rather remarkable uh, process. Well, the way I think about all these interactions is like an intimate dance. And you can imagine it, so the proteins all have partners, and the partners modulate each other's activities in each other's actions. And it's an interesting analogy because the molecules I look dance on membrane surfaces. So those, that's where those interactions are taking place. <coughs> the nitty gritty of all these um, experiments is trying to analyze a model that you develop to try to explain what you're measuring. So we use, we do collaborate with other scientists who use NMR, X-ray crystallography, cryo-EM, Nobel Prize was just given recently for cryo-EM, um, to get pictures of what these various states, so they'll look at the complexes and get the end states of the molecules. But if you want to follow the trajectory, 
the trajectory. You can get there by following what, ha um, by using optical spectroscopies or EPR or good way. There's other techniques that are available. One can use analytical ultracentrifugation, um, to looking at the formation of complexes and how those are regulated. The interpretation, though, requires that there's good collaboration between computational chemists, theoreticians, and the experimentalists. And I th think in terms of the experiment driving the, th the theory and then the theory in turn driving the experiment. And we also look at the functionality. How do we get the functionality in looking at these structures, enzyme assays? So we know that when we modify the proteins, we put probes on them. Does that destroy their activity? Does it, um, or alter it in some way? Are we looking at what we think we're looking at? So at the heart of it is, what is that model? And so that's kind of complicated. In many cases, we start off with something fairly simple and think of the world as a two-state model. Now that sounds pretty naive, but it, in many sense, we can really answer a lot of things as just, is it this way or is it that way? And to most intensive purposes, a lot of things do behave as if they were two-state. But then when we, if we get compelling evidence, then we can find out what those other intermediate states might be. And that's the drive. So our approach to this is using fluorescence spectroscopy. And um, fluorescence is a phenomenon, understanding what that, or the beginning of the understanding of what that is, really goes back to the 19th um, century. And the work of Sir John Frederick William Herschel was one of the ones who did a lot of the inter introductory work with in fluorescence. And he studied this molecule, quinine, quinine, um, Malaria, gin and tonic. You know, you hold, take your gin and tonic, and if you hold it up to the sun at about the right angle, and you don't, you're not blinded by the sun, the sun's behind you, you can see the fluorescence coming off it. And you get this, this beautiful, this is a pretty concentrated solution, but you get this beautiful fluorescence from it. So probably in the spring and the summer, you've had a good introduction to fluorescence. Some of us. Um, very important in the development of modern contemporary photophysics is the work that was carried out by Alexander Jablonski, or we call him Jablonski. Um, so Jablonski, you've, in chemistry, you've heard of Jablonski diagrams. We'll talk a little bit about Jablonski diagrams. They're important. But Jablonski was a uh, remarkable man. Um, he, had, he got his degree in physics. and. After service in the military, in the Russian army and the Polish army, at the end of the war, First World War, he uh, c c continued his studies in physics at the University of Warsaw. At the same time, like a lot of great scientists, he was also a great musician. And he was first violin of the Warsaw Opera. Then later, he got his um, degree, his doctorate under Stefan Pankowski on the influence of the change of wavelength of excitation light on fluorescence spectra. So he was looking at different excitations and seeing what sort of spectra he um, found. And then if you look at these dates, you'll realize that this is at the time of the birth of quantum mechanics, you know, 1926. So there's this parallel going on. And Turin, in, which is north of Warsaw, was an incredible uh, place for, for the development of photophysics. They weren't doing many, much experimental work there, but they were doing great theoretical work. I collaborated when I was at Mount Sinai with a guy, Roman Osman, who did a postdoc in Turin in physics. It's interesting. He, um, then in 1935, he developed the energy level diagram, which is our familiar Jablonski diagram. And it was to explain the kinetics and here's when we were talking about lifetimes earlier, the kinetics of the fluorescence phenomenon, the phosphorescence phenomenon, and delayed fluorescence. And the, uh, give you a little bit of an idea, this is the t town of Turin, the, the wall, church in the back. I was there uh, for uh, the 100th centennial of Jablonski's birthday, and you can still see the bullet holes the church windows from the First World War. And it's an amazing place. 
There in the town is a little observatory, which is where Nikolai Koperniki, Copernicus, had his observatory. And so this is the town where the heliocentric model of the universe was developed. I don't, don't know that Copernicus was there when he, when he actually developed the model because he spent a lot of time studying the University of Bologna, Padova, and Italy, and other places. But the university takes great pride in that Copernicus, and that's the name of the university, is Mikołaj Koperniki University. I can't say university in Polish, but that's okay. And this is um, Jablonski, Professor Jablonski now, chair of the department. In 1935, and this photo is courtesy of his daughter, Professor Danuta Frkowiak, who is also a fine physicist in her own right. And this is the familiar um, energy level diagram showing the excitation and then the process for fluorescence emission, non-radiative emission, inter system crossing to triplet states, relaxations at, between higher levels. It's not the, exactly what he had in his notebooks, but it's just a cleaned up version. Um, and then down here he has a little definition of what lifetime is. Basically, it's the inverse of the sum of the processes, radiative and non-radiative. And so here's, we go through, I'm going to take you through the familiar Jablonski diagram, since this is all about kinetics. And we have um, basically a ground state singlet ground state, and then there's an absorption process which takes place in about the time of a vibration, 10 to minus 15 seconds, and then there can be some time later a fluorescence event. So you get, you'll get to some higher excited l levels, everything collects down in the bottom level of the excited state, and then sometimes later in a, in a spontaneous process there'll be a mission. You can kind of think of you know, trying to be in a crowded theater and if you make a big noise or a gun goes off or something, it's not a good joke considering the recent events, but people trying to get out of a room, it'll take some time for them to get out. And so that will, it's like, you know, radioactive decay, something like that sort. The other possibility is that we could have inter-system crossing, which is non-radiative, so you've got, start out with opposite spins in the ground state, you now go to the excited state, you've got the um, electrons in two different levels. Now because they're in two different levels, you can still satisfy the exclusion principle and flip. And that gives you now what's called parallel, it's a paramagnetic state, that is the triplet state. And in fact, uh, we, can you know, I, we can look at the right combination of spin quantum numbers, and it is really, truly a triplet state. There's three levels, and asymmetric molecules have different levels, but they're very closely linked together. They're about something on the order of about a tenth of a wave number. The separation is very tight, so on average, in even liquid nitrogen temperatures, they emit back to the ground state as if they were a single state because everything averages. And that was, those times are between, oh, uh, 10, 100 nanoseconds to many seconds, depending upon temperature and other features. But this is, these kinetics are important because they're influenced by the local environment of where the probes are. are. And that's what we use when we're going to look use with microscopy to try to look at the time resolved side of the fluorescence. So the sort of things that we're doing with the fluorescence is we're looking at events, depending upon the particular technique that we use in imaging, which extend from nanoseconds up to seconds. We can do, this is a slice of a plant, so we can do fluorescence lifetime imaging. I'll talk about that a little bit, uh, where we can combine an intensity-based image, and this is where it gets a little difficult to get the people said we can scan we can look at really what the true image is in terms of just intensities but then we can take a fluorescence lifetime at each point in that curve and i'll show you how we can do that and then we can look at the superposition and we may find something which has all the same color but because of local environment the lifetime will be different so it allows you to distinguish processes um, i'll talk a little bit about correlation spectroscopy and then i showed you those nano disks on a um, plate in that first slide, and you can look at, do a blinking analysis and look at things binding to surfaces or leaving surfaces. 
for example. So how do we measure the excited state lifetime? One way we do it is with um, a spectrometer um, where we have a light, and this is the spectrometer we have in the lab. This is an instrument that we designed in collaboration with a company in Spokane, Quantum Northwest, uh, back in the late 90s for measuring lifetimes. And it has bunches of filter wheels and all sorts of things. There's a laser beam coming in here, getting directed over towards the sample. But it's easier to see by this diagram. You have a light source, and you can use polarizers or not, and a sample, and then at right angles to the uh, source because fluorescence takes place in all directions, and you don't want to have to deal with the intensity of the light coming straight through. You could look at any angle you wanted, but it's easier to do it in 90 degrees. We have a detector, and whoops. And that's similar to the, uh, the principle um, that I was talking about. And that's basically how this instrument is, is set up. So we have the light coming in, and then it, it's emitted, and then over here, and then we take it to two different detectors. We do uh, experiments to look at rotational motion. I'm not going to talk about those today, but uh, that allows you to look at the rotation of different sized molecules. You can see complexes forming because big complexes will rotate more slowly than small complexes will, and that sort of thing. So how do we measure an excited state lifetime? There's a number of different methods available for doing this. And the method that we use is called time-correlated single photon counting. It's perhaps easier to understand. And basically what we do in this sort of experiment is we pulse, we have a pulse laser happen, which is pulsing at some certain frequency evenly in time. And then we have many pulses coming through compared to the photons detected. So we're truly under what are called single photon conditions. So we'll get many, many pulses, see nothing, and then we'll see an event, maybe one out of 100 pulses. And that will, but since you're going at pulse rates in the megahertz range, you can collect the data in a reasonable amount of time. And so for every photon that's measured, we, it's, it basically runs a little clock in the electronics. And Statistically, just like the chickens jumping off a roof or people leaving the room, they'll arrive at different times. And the probability we uh, build up as a histogram. Can I ask but, a question? So how do you know that fluorescence photon came from that closest laser pulse instead of one that was way, way over here? two or three laser pulse flips farther to the left? How do we know that? How do we know that? Yeah, how do you know it came from that one and not from that, that time plus? That's a, good, that's a good question. What we have is we have a, a little device which basically resets with every laser pulse. And so it starts every time there's a, uh, there's a, uh, a pulse. Uh, there's several different ways to do that. But the simple answer is to just say you can imagine starting the, a clock. And then if nothing happens, by the time the next pulse it just goes off and says, nobody home. And then so you're, you're counting the, the time to the shortest time. And then you can tell from looking at the pulse between, the, you know when the starts are each time, that you'll know that that would be the appropriate thing. Actually, we do it a little bit differently because we're using high repetition devices. We work in what's called reverse time, but I'm not going to go into that. <laughs> but think about going through negative time. But if your pulses were too close together... You get what's called pileup. Okay. It, yeah. As opposed to just confusing. And if they're too, Right. And so the thing is, well, you're going to get... Your, your, most of your pulses will come out right after the flash. Okay. Right? I mean, look like but the time. distribution with time, since it's a probability, will be at some slope. So let's look at, let's look at some data. So that's what it looks like. What you take. So here's the pulse. And it's actually wide and uh, has some finite width and time. Think uh, we take that into account. And there's the decay curve. And so, so basically, the most probable time for the event is going to be the instant right after excitation. Has to be. That's, and then the least probable time will be some time later. And you can see it running out. And then the fluorescence will take place in nanoseconds, and the phosphorescence will take place in micro to milliseconds. And the most important thing is that we look at the slope, we measure the slope, 
and whether there's more than one exponential in there because that reflects the processes going on. So if there's something like uh, a proton transfer process going on, this will not be a, a simple single exponential decay. If there's some sort of relaxation process going on during the lifetime of the excited state, that will not be a simple single exponential decay. But we can analyze and we can find out from the fingerprints of the kinds of kinetics what the processes are. And that's an, so what we do with the imaging, now this is the heart of what I'm, I want to try to get across, is that with the thing called fluorescence lifetime imaging, I showed you that image earlier, um, you can see from the short lifetimes, the blue, to the longer lifetimes, yellow to the red, we're measuring different environments in this image. And we can see binding interactions, and we can discriminate one kind of tissue. If you were looking at biofilms and something going on, and there's a change, we could probably pick that up on some sort of surface. The other technique that we use a lot if we're going to measure translational diffusion is we use fluorescence correlation spectroscopy, and I'll explain how that works in a couple of slides. But we're able to look at diffusion. We can see measure concentrations. Um, this is an autocorrelation function against log of time, and that's sensitive in the microsecond to millisecond time range. And then we can also do single molecule analysis of blinking. So we've looked at binding to surfaces, things which light up when it binds to lipid surfaces and then aren't bright when they're in solution. So here's Shell Terwilliger. Um, and this is an instrument that she built. So this is the instrument that Shell built. And this is basically set up for doing um, uh, fluorescence correlation spectroscopy. It's a little confocal microscope. And here's the pinhole, the heart of a confocal. And the idea is that the pinhole allows you to look directly at this observation volume without a lot of other fluorescence. In the wide field, you'll get, uh, if you don't have that pinhole there, you'll just get a lot of other diffuse fluorescence background. And this is what gives you the high resolution when you're scanning or the, high, or the very specific volume. So we're looking at, with a high, uh, with, with a, um, high magnification, high numerical aperture objective, we can focus down into basically 10 to the minus 15th of a liter, femtoliter or, or less. So if you're working with dilute concentrations of molecules on the order of, say, nanomolar, statistically, if you play around with the spreadsheet, you'll find out that you've got basically one molecule at a time, more or less, maybe half a molecule, what is a half a molecule, in the, the diffusion volume. And then if we're going to look at another kind of experiment, which I'll talk about, energy transfer or different colors, we can use um, uh, different colored lasers and then combine them, send them into the volume. And then looking at the fluorescence coming back down, we use avalanche photodiodes with detectors and some filters to select what color emission that we're going to have. So this is the heart of uh, what I want to talk about and the heart of the opportunities that we might have here. Uh, a couple of years ago, Shell and I wrote grants to the National Science Foundation and to the NIH uh, to get to be able to do uh, fluorescence lifetime imaging, correlation spectroscopy um, in, in a confocal uh, platform. And the, as I'll explain, these are two rather different uh, platforms. This is a, what's called a laser scanning confocal microscope. I'll explain what laser scanning is. And then this is um, uses what's called objective scanning. It's a very different process, but allows you to work with fewer optics. And so you get higher sensitivity, better throughput. So the award for the NSF was generous. Uh, we got uh, matching funds from the Murdoch Foundation, which helps across the Northwest. Uh, we have some funds in, from the Murdoch Award, which will allow, uh, which will fund vouchers for anybody that's interested in coming to do some experiments. So keep that in mind. And if anybody's interested in trying to do some pioneering experiments, I'll be glad to help them. Um, I'll help you through the voucher process. This other instrument, the laser scanning instrument, is Zeiss, and this is really great for biologists who want to look at cells or 
you know, worms and weird kind of stuff, uh, things that are moving around cells. And um, it's a little bit more expensive instrument. It's from Zeiss, after all, they're, they're expensive, pricey. But this is a, uh, uh, a confocal which can also be upgraded to do what's called super resolution uh, imaging. So one of the issues that you have is what's resolution? Well, the best resolution that you can obtain really has to do with the wavelength of the light that you use. So the, there's a limit called Abbe's limit, physicist. And what it is is that you can think of it as that if you take the wavelength of light, let's say you've got 500 or 600 nanometer light. Let's take 600 nanometer light. Math's easy. That means I can I have a resolution of 300 nanometers. 500, I can get down to 250. If I go too down in the UV, I start to blow things up. So I don't want, that doesn't help. With super resolution techniques now, which are truly based upon physics uh, principles rather than just doing some formulas and uh, knowing what are called point spread functions, uh, there's, a, uh, you, there's a thing called stimulated uh, emission depletion microscopy, uh, for which uh, by, uh, Steph, there was a technique invented by Stefan Hell, got the Nobel Prize a couple of years ago, and they're down to now roughly resolution of around 40 nanometers. And it's using Einstein's principle that it's, you can get around the spontaneous process by shining in another way, uh, burst of light of the same energy, which fills that energy gap, and then you'll bring the molecules that are in the excited state immediately down to the ground state. Because what sky was up, it's got to go down. So that's stimulated emission as opposed to spontaneous emission. So when we're talking about the lifetime, we're talking about a spontaneous process, not a stimulated process. With that stimulated process, they're able to bleach out an area around the spot. And so that you're looking, you know what size spot you have. It's pretty clever. There's other techniques um, that, uh, which are, uh, that Zeiss has developed, one called an area scan, that gives you roughly about 140 nanometers. So it's not as good, but it's also, you know, pure physics. So we can upgrade this. It will probably be the biologists that are interested in that resolution, but who knows? There may be need for that in material science that we could get down, get down to looking at some things. So these are the instruments, and I'll, I'll go into the scanning mechanisms. This is the heart of how they're different. So with the, with the laser scanning instrument, you have galvanometers, which are rastering across the, uh, uh, the field. So that moves the beam back and forth and collects the fluorescence. And you have the luxury of being able to use a turret and use different power lenses. So I can locate an, uh, some object I'm interested in with a low power objective that's on some odd looking sample and then bring my high power objective in place and then focus down on the small area. Difficult to do on this other instrument, which is the picoquant microtime. It uses what's called a, um, a, a uh, objective scanning mechanism. Here you can see the, the objective and we are scanning over a very small area and we, with about nanometer precision and we get a very high uh, resolution uh, image, but with better optics, but it's a lot slower. So if I'm going to look at materials and what I use for a lot of the experiments I do, I prefer to use the microtime. When working with the biologists, I'll use the Zeiss. Two great instruments. Uh, so the features of the, of the microtime are these are the colors that we uh, can currently use for excitation sources. We can bring in others. I have a, a, um, a wider range ultrafast, which is not hooked up at the present. But these are the uh, colors that we can excite with. Um, we've got very good uh, response functions. We're using what are called hybrid detectors, which have high quantum efficiencies. That's how you can get down to single molecule conditions. And then we uh, are able to do what are called dual focus experiments, which means we use two lasers, same wavelength, different polarization going in, but it gives us some advantages for doing correlation spectroscopy, which gives us much higher precision, for example. And then there's the software. So that's the basic setup, and this is really what the box looks like. An Olympus microscope up, right, and then this has the pinholes and everything else in this box. And you open it up, 
and it's an optical table. Very German. Very nice. So how big is it? How big is it? Yeah. It's about... I, I saw some of the earlier generation ones. Um, when I was at the Biophotonic Center in um, Sacramento, um, they had one of the first ones in the U.S. It was about half again as large, but they've got this down to, um, worked out to a T. I mean, it's absolutely a beautiful piece of machinery. And the optics are very easy to change in and out. This lid, whoops, this lid comes off. And so you can just reach in there. Users don't do that. I do that. My, well, my graduate student does that. Or the staff scientist. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about fluorescence correlation spectroscopy. What is that? Um, that was a technique which was developed um, by a guy named Elliot Elson, Watt Webb. They were at Cornell at the time. And they tried to do it before confocal microscopes were invented. But the principle is the same. So what they were doing is they were saying if you could excite a small volume, you should be able to see if you're dilute enough fluctuations in intensity when a molecule by Brownian motion diffuses in and out of that volume. And then you'll get little bursts when it's coming, when it comes back in. And then you'll get a decrease when it goes out. And if you look at the, if you correlate, you know, pairwise, over time, you'll find out that over um, short times, what you'll have is that you'll have a memory that the fluorescence is still there because you're looking at it time. You don't need pulse lasers to do that, although there's advantages to using pulse lasers to do that. You can just use a continuous wave laser. But you'll get, you can write a function, then you'll get what's called an autocorrelation function. After some time, it's just going to be random noise, and that's what this part of the curve looks like. So here's log time. That's what the shape is. And the half time for that curve is related is proportional to the diffusion time. You can get, calculate the diffusion coefficients from that. That's very useful because, again, if you're looking at the formation of complexes or the size of molecules, the diffusion coefficient through the Stokes-Einstein relationship, we can talk about that. Um, we can calculate how, bi how big the molecules are. Big molecules have a lot of surface area. They're going to diffuse more slowly because of friction, simply at a certain temperature. You don't have to worry about the viscosity. So, Stokes Einstein, I was just talking about that. So there's Sir George Stokes, Navier Stokes. He did a lot of work in flow dynamics, uh, brilliant physicist. Um, and Einstein in 1905, I think this picture's from about 1904, uh, worked out the theory, published on the theory of Brownian motion. Absolutely brilliant piece of work. So he just treated water as being very small, compared to a slightly larger molecule, which was obviously all the wrong assumptions, but it worked pretty well. He just said it was a sphere. You know, as physicists like to work with spherical cows. Um, and so the term that's related to the friction is the term on the bottom of this curve, the denominator. So here we've got the Boltzmann constant, the temperature, and then we have the diameter of the particle, and then we have the viscosity of the medium. And this number six, is in there because that refers to how the molecule interacts with the solvent. So this is what's called the friction coefficient. And there's other, you'll see this in um, uh, other kinds of flow equations, but they will have a different sort of equation. But the proportionality is the Boltzmann's constant and, and the temperature. And using that, we are, we're, uh, radius, we are able to get uh, the radius of hydration from the diffusion coefficient, and that's proportional to the to the third, you know, to the cube root of the molecular weight. So we're able to. That's assuming things are spherical. And for again, you know, I talked about two states. Spheres are reasonable assumptions for a lot of cases. Um, even for a molecule as assembly that's as uh, asymmetric as that, even though that's got about an aspect, about maybe a two to one aspect ratio, then it still behaves pretty much like a sphere. This is a nano disk. And we, they are very precise, uniform um, assemblies. This is the belt protein, which we express in bacteria, purify it. My students purify it. I don't. Um, and then they assemble it with lipids. And you get these roughly, oh, the, to go right to the outside, it's about eight and a half, nine nanometer um, 
disc, pucky, like a little hockey puck, and or frisbee. And this shows an experiment being done where he's, uh, my student has been looking at the binding of cytochrome C, which is an interesting small molecule, but it's found in mitochondria. But it's found that when there's been oxidative damage, that vitamins, that uh, cytochrome C will interact with a lipid called cardiolipin, which is there, and start cell death. And so he's been trying to understand what is the nature of the binding interaction. So he's been using correlation spectroscopy to do that. So he's looked at zinc cytochrome C, putting a, changing the metal in it so he can see the fluorescent zinc. You'll see that the cytochrome is very small uh, compared to the nanodisc. And this is the diffusion curve for the uh, cytochrome C by itself. And then you add the nanodiscs and it slows down a lot. And so you can calculate. You notice it's also not a, uh, a simple curve anymore. It's got a hook in it. And if you look titrate, you can calculate from how that changes. I can get the ratio of the free and the bound. That tells me how it partitions into the surface and onto the surface. Um, problem with correlation spectroscopy is that there's a number of artifacts, optical artifacts, which can uh, give you trouble. And so that really makes it not a quantitative measurement. So we have a technique to get around that. You know, these are things which are just normally occur going from experiment to experiment. And we use what's called the dual focus experiment. So in the dual focus experiment, you're using two lasers of different polarization, and then when they go through what's called a Walston or an Omarski prism, they'll come to two different focal points. And then we can pulse them into alternately. And if we are, know where the, where exactly, and we can calibrate it, what the, where the focal points are, we now can tell how long it takes for a molecule to diffuse from one point to the other. There's an area of overlap. We do what's called cross-correlation. And here you can see the overlap. And then we're able to get a precise number. It improves the precision to about plus or minus 8% which is pretty remarkable. So that's the, ab yeah. And then we, can, going on once it's been set up, we don't have to do anything with further calibration um, dyes, and we can detect, th this is probably boasting a bit, 4% change, probably closer to a 5 to 10% change in um, hydrodynamic radius. And so here's Harmon's project doing dual focus. He's been looking at the um, formation of a dimer because it's thought that cytochrome C, when it forms a dimer, it, it will it, um, interact with lipids much more efficiently. And so he's looked at human, yeast, and horse, and you can see that they pretty much behave in the same way. So let's talk about lifetime imaging now. So here's an example of red blood cells. This is uh, done by Andre Holian's group. And what they're looking at is titanium oxide nanoparticles interacting with red blood cells. And you can see from the color, um, here's the, oh, the short lifetime is the blue, and then you can see the longer lifetimes, that there's something is going on that you're getting a much shorter lifetime. Uh, there's a fluorescent, special fluorescent probe that he's putting in. He's also adding to the uh, red cells. So it's not the red cell membrane itself. This is the probe that's sitting in the membrane and then adding the uh, titanium oxide. And the controls are a little uneven, but that's because they're a heterogeneous population of cells. But they find out with some of the nanoparticles that they get rather dramatic changes in the, um, in the membranes. It's dose dependent and it's time dependent. And so they're using this as, a, um, as an empirical way to try to look at the interactions with the membranes. Uh, let's look at some applications now for the laser scanning microscope. So it's a standard, or a super standard, uh, uh, a microscope, but we have the same electronics now from the Germans, from PicoQuant, uh, which are processing the signal. So the microtime and the, uh, and the Zeiss both are, have the same timing electronics, so the, for the time resolve part. 
Um, so in a sense, they do the same thing, but just a little bit differently. And um, the, uh, there's, we get a lot more different wavelengths for doing the CW experiments, but for doing the um, time resolved experiments, we were using basically the same combination of lasers that we have for the micro time. And this shows you the uh, pico quant, the micro time side of it. We have a 440 rather than a 420, but the 485 and 640 are the same. Detections are the same, same software for data analysis. So if you learn how to use one instrument, you can uh, learn how to use the other fairly easily. So which one you would choose to use depends upon the experiment that you want to do. So one of the things that we've done is, which, um, is energy transfer experiments to try to look at interactions, both in solution and in cells. I showed you a picture in the first slide. I mentioned that we were seeing the opening and closing of a G protein. Well, that's what we use here. Um, so there's the G protein. So energy transfer, short history in 30 seconds. Um, basic ideas were developed by Francis Perrin and his father Jean, or Jean, I guess, uh, Perrin, um, and then developed the full, the full quantum mechanical treatment was actually first developed by Robert Oppenheimer. And I think that was, um, and then shortly thereafter, uh, uh, Furster, which is the name that we associate with resonance energy transfer, basically uh, did the solutions for both the classical treatment, non-quantum treatment, and then the quantum treatment. And uh, the quantum treatment that uh, Furster, uh, but his results were the same as what Oppenheimer results. We all associate Oppenheimer with a bomb. I mean, these physicists have done a lot of other fantastic work. And there's some other physicists that, uh, that worked uh, in the, uh, have done a lot of work. If you uh, Google resonance energy transfer and uh, Peran's name or a guy named Clegg, Robert Clegg, C-L-E-G-G. -G. He used to be, a, uh, he was a physicist at University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana, used to be at Max Planck. Um, he has written some beautiful essays on the history of the technique. So what is the energy transfer about? You've got a donor molecule and an acceptor molecule, and we treat them as if they were dipole antennas. So the angle is going to be important. The proximity will be important, basically is the sixth root. And then what has to happen is that there has to be isoenergetic levels between the emission of a, the donor and the absorbance of the acceptor. So you get, if we look at, uh, uh, here's an acceptor, there's the absorption band of an acceptor, and here's the fluorescence band of, of a, a, the emitter. And the area where they overlap is basically is what allows that to happen. It's called the overlap integral, and sometimes referred to Fermi golden rule density of states. But depending upon the overlap, in, overlap integral, which depends upon the spectral contours, themselves and the angle of the dipoles, you'll have a different efficiency of energy transfer. But the distances that you see on average are something on the order 50% transfer is around, say, four to five nanometers. So one of the things that uh, people have done in imaging in biological samples is that they'll see that the color, they'll do an intensity-based image and see a molecule that's labeled with one fluorescent protein, another one with another fluorescent protein, or with a different dye, and say, oh, they're in the same place. They must be interacting, but I can be far away, or I can be close together. No interaction, uh, interaction. But if I were to look at the lifetime, what will happen is that the, uh, the lifetime of the donor will decrease if there's energy transfer, and you'll see that, and so it's sensitive. So you can do it. Let me sh uh, show you an experiment where this was done in cells. So what we're looking at here is uh, a lifetime imaging experiment for energy transfer with two different fluorescent proteins of um, N-methyl D-aspartate receptors. These are involved in, um, in, in uh, basically signaling in the brain, nerves. And uh, what the person who did this um, Experimental, uh, she's a postdoc for Casper Hansen, Linda Dorville. Um, she's taken these subunits, there's a, one called NR1, 
NR3, I don't know what these mean, they're different you know, people, I guess, or something like that, but she's been able to show that if, she, um, here's the intensity-based image, here's the CYFP um, the donor, and here's the YFP acceptor, and then if you look at the lifetime, there's the uh, lifetime image, and you can see that it dims down when both of these are, when the acceptor is, a, is present. And this is evidence that there's energy transfer taking place on the, uh, where the receptors are located on the surface of the membrane, because they get expressed and translocated to the surface. And here's what the decay curves look like. So here's without uh, the acceptor, and this is with the acceptor. It doesn't look like much of a change, but it's actually quite significant. And she's able to demonstrate it in the following way. Here's with CF, with the uh, cerulean uh, fluorescence protein. She gets a beautiful intensity image. And here it is with the, uh, without any labeling on the NR3. And there's nothing. And then if you look at the lifetime distribution, this is looking at the cells. So you'll get just the emission from the one. So here's a, a great example of being able to demonstrate for sure inside a cell that you've really got an interaction going on. And then finally, I'm just going to wind up here with this. This is a totally different uh, technique. This is called um, fluorescence recovery after photobleaching. It's a technique that's been around for a long time to look at, say, diffusion in membranes. And that's uh, what uh, the, its experiment is doing, is looking at diffusion in two different compartments of a nematode cell, worms, using the uh, Zeiss. And so what we see here are some bleaching spots. Here's an area of interest, and here's an area of interest. And we can see the trace of the background yellow, which has a slow recovery. And then, but you'll notice that this starts to recover up to almost the intensity of the original bleach. And then because they're in a different location, the fluorescence intensity starts out differently for the ones which are in the granules and it comes down and doesn't, it never recovers, meaning basically it didn't diffuse out of the area. So there's an area of rapid diffusion, an area of slow diffusion. And when she normalizes the data, uh, this shows you what, what goes on. So in the cytoplasm, you see a recovery that goes up essentially to where it starts. And then in the granule, things, once they're bleached out, they're just not moving after the, um, Bleach is over. So that's kind of interesting. So just to uh, wind up now, um, this is my respects to Shell. She's moved on to administration. And this is Zifan Wang, who's the new staff scientist it's from Merced, just got here about three weeks ago. He says it's a lot cooler in Montana than in Merced. Um, and this is Harmon Steele, the graduate student who's been working with the nanodisks and who's been running the core in the time between Shell's departure and Zephon's uh, arrival. Anyway, all fantastic people. Um, and then the money. So this yeah, NIH, NSF, the support of the center, um, the Murdoch Foundation, the VPR for research, uh, also kicked in for the for money on the Zeiss. I'd like to recognize uh, Katja Voronina, that's the nematode uh, PI, Stephen Sprang, who I collaborate with doing the G-protein work, um, Andre Holian, who's doing the work with the uh, nanoparticles, Casper Hansen, that was the beautiful uh, fluorescent label proteins looking at these uh, receptors, um, and Bruce Bowler's working with, on the NanoDisc project I have a cytochrome C, and that's Harmon's thesis, so we're collaborating on that. And with that, I think I'll stop. So do people have any questions? I've got one. Please. Shoot. So put it back to the first slide you put up of the Jablonski diagram. You probably don't need to put it back up. Sure. Um, you excited it into what looked like a vibrational structure of the upper state. Yeah. And then there was a there was a pretty sizable time difference between the 15, 10 to fifteenth second excitation pulse and then the fluorescent. Yep. That's right. So I'm assuming that the 
the difference in time was for it to relax down through the various vibrational states. Actually, Is that right? Well, yes, no. Uh, the relaxation that takes place uh, really is so the is about maybe on the order of about a thousand times slower because the excitation itself you're talking about motion of an electron that's that's uh, pretty light compared to the motion of nuclei right and so the vibrations of nuclei are going to be a lot slower so order of a thousand maybe so we're seeing you know the just the reaction of the system you know you've got this adiabatic pulse and there's heat dissipated and so there's also non-radiative uh, decay due to the fact that you're losing heat to the lattice to, the, to that solvent and then the lowest level is kind of a trap you're, you're sitting there you I mean you started to decay down but it's you, you live in that excited state for a while and depending upon how loud it is that'll be how long it takes to come down so for example if you take a fluorophore which is a very high extinction coefficient cross-section easy up that means easy down you take something which uh, doesn't uh, I still get up about as fast but I just don't have the cross-section I'll have a much longer uh, lifetime decay and then for the triplet state I've got to wait once it, that's but now if I were to look at the yields it's interesting because in aromatic molecules the triplet yields about 50% goes that way over the intersystem crossing 50 percent you know maybe depend 10 percent 50 percent 80 percent if you have a if you've got something like an inorganic complex a metal complex those because of the heavy atom there those intersystem crossing yields are close to 100 percent they're really efficient so you don't get any fluorescence out of those metal complexes so i've been working with ed rosenberg um, making complexes like that because we wanted to make probes which have really long lifetimes and many microseconds so like if we want to look at the nanodisc motion the tumbling time of the nanodiscs not the translational but the rotational time is on the order of around 200 nanoseconds that's a long time for a fluorophore fluorescence is over in 10 nanoseconds so I won't have moved very far by the time a fluorescent probe will have died so everything's going to just appear like it's frozen. But anyway, that's got a little bit more than you asked for, but um, but that's that's those are the properties that we're taking advantage of. So who wants to come to Missoula? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. diagram you know everything comes down to the model so you have to start with molecules from which you already know the structure composition symmetry all that kind of stuff or not necessarily I know as much as I can get mm -hmm. and there are cases of course I mean there's a lot more structures now when I was in graduate school or postdoc and the number of structures that we had of proteins six, six maybe uh, so we were doing things like making predictions from um, hydrodynamic measurements, say, uh, there's a really great textbook by a guy named Tanford, and there were tables in there, um, uh, just looking at different, some very asymmetric molecules, and of course, the greater the surface area, the more, the slower the translation is. So you can predict for a sphere about what the translational diffusion time should be. And then if it gets a lot longer, then you say, well, I don't have a structure, but I know that that's highly asymmetric. And so there, you know, Perrin, there's a, uh, worked on that theory a lot. That's the, you know, the, the Stoke, um, you know, Perrin worked on looking at these changes in axial ratios and made theoretical predictions on, on what the asymmetry should be. Um, I worked on a system uh, that was involved in blood coagulation and was able to predict before we got the crystal structure uh, that it was highly asymmetric. The one thing that we, I didn't predict correctly is I thought it was far more asymmetric than it turned out to be. Now you can say, here's where structure comes in. Why would that be? Well, the surface of a protein is not as smooth as convolutions in it and so you actually end up with a lot more surface area 
and you don't know what that surface area will be. So it, it, you tend to overestimate. That's just the nature of the beast. But if I use a combination, which we did of rotational motion and translational motion, I can limit the possible shapes. So those are the, some of the sorts of analyses that we would do in the absence of a structure. Now that there's a lot of structures out there, we can do marvelous things. And you know, it's amazing. People are even, I saw some uh, a talks about four or five years ago. I don't know how far it's gone, but people trying to do single molecule structure determinations, basically shooting a single molecule into a beam, looking at the scattering off it, the x-ray scattering. And of course, it blows up the molecule by the time it gets into the beam. But you collect enough of these over and over again, and the scattering profiles, you can build, basically, you can say, OK, we're going to have possible possible orientation. You build an idea of what the rough outlines. People use light scattering, too, for example, you know, x-ray light scattering to try to get some idea of what these shapes are. So yeah, it's uh, bring as many tools to the uh, party as you can. And you had a second question. Yeah, could you talk a little bit about the applications to material science? Could you repeat the question? Oh, uh, the question is, uh, how about uh, applications to material science? I can't speak too much about it. But I can speak about, a little bit about it. So for example, uh, I've been doing some work with Monica Serban. Um, and she's been look, working with, with uh, materials called fixotropic materials, ketchup, shake it. Um, and so we've been, uh, one of her students has been putting fluorescent probes in her fixotropic materials and trying to look at diffusive motion. There's one. Second one is, um, the, uh, the working with the red blood cells, trying to see what, what's going on there. And we've looked at different sorts of fluorescence probes to try to get an idea of uh, what's happening with those red blood cells, probes which are sensitive more to what I would call, um, for better words, I don't really like thinking of membranes as viscous because viscosity, I think, is being a, a uniform medium, but you can push it a little bit, things which are a little bit more rigid or less rigid, OK? Um, that's, that's another example. A third example I can think of is that we're collaborating with a group. And um, actually, they're buying fee-for-service. Uh, it's in Missoula trying to look at um, polished uh, geological samples and trying to find out what happens to the surfaces and the defects on the surface. And so they're doing just optical experiments, but they were aware of the idea of using the lifetime imaging technique because they've done some work with a group in California. And so we're going to be doing some lifetime imaging. So those are three examples. I had one question here. She's busy writing. What? You, oh, let's see. Ooh. I don't want to put you on the spot. I'm thinking about, um, oh, it's just a comment, I guess. <laughs> um, it's interesting how you have all these different methods with acronyms, trap, trap and whatnot. Um, there are kind of comparisons. Of yeah, it's alphabet soup. From one state to another. Right. It's pretty cool. Um, it's very interesting stuff. And it, thanks for speaking to us. It's very cool. Okay. Well, thank you. Any more questions? Well, I really appreciate your attention, everybody. Thank you very much. <laughs>